most important parts of any video game narrative is the intro. Now originally this script was about one specific video game, but I discovered that a few years back someone else had made the video I was planning on making, and their script was nearly identical to the one I'd written, at least as the bullet points went. So instead of putting that video out there and potentially being accused of plagiarism, I decided to broaden the scope of this script into one more generally about good video game intros, why they're important, and how to execute them well. It's more frustrating that this is actually the second time this has happened. I had been sitting on a script for a video about Prey's Blue Cannon that was going to release for the anniversary of the game, but then Game Maker's Toolkit swooped in with a video that was beat for beat all the same points in my script. Great minds or something. But I'm off track. I'm sure by now some of you are thinking, why are you calling them video game intros and not tutorials? Well, as video games have matured, the traditional tutorial level has become something of a relic, with games spreading out or obfuscating their learning materials rather than condensing them all into one obviously curated learning space. As certain control schemes have become more or less standardized across many games and many genres, developers have had less of a need to hold players' hands as much as they did in the earliest days of video game development. I can't recall the last time a first-person shooter told me which button I'd need to press to shoot my gun. I mean, maybe there's some recent examples out there, but I certainly haven't played them or noticed them. With this familiarity, developers have been able to create more creative tutorial environments, especially as many games have begun to incorporate more in-depth narratives, where no longer do developers just have to convey the necessary controls and mechanics a player should be familiar with, but also the story beats they'll need to understand as the game begins. And as any regular player of video games knows, there is not a one-size-fits-all style of video game tutorial or introduction. The right method of introduction is entirely dependent on the type of game in question. With that in mind, we'll be looking primarily at three games, Campo Santos Firewatch, Heart Machines Hyperlight Drifter, and ID's 2016 Doom, as each have distinctly different but equally effective ways of going about delivering their necessary controls and exposition. First, let's look at Firewatch, a game where, in the description for the Let's Play my buddy and I did for the game's release, I wrote, the first 15 minutes of this game are like the first 10 minutes of Up. Unlike the other two example games we'll talk about, Firewatch delivers its opening moments in an entirely different format than anything else in the game. Where Hyperlight and Doom rely on cutscenes and scripted events, Firewatch begins not as a 3D exploration game, but as a choose-your-own-adventure game. The game's 3D world is introduced in the moments between decisions. As necessary exposition and character development is revealed within the text-driven choose-your-own-adventure format, you'll walk down, literally and figuratively, the path leading you to the secluded fire lookout tower that will serve as the hub during the main events of the game. Here is where the game introduces the mechanical systems you'll become familiar with, things like movement, obviously, item collection, and traversing obstructions. Now why is this form of tutorial effective? The control tutorial is straightforward, elegant, it gets what needs to be done, done, quickly. The unique aspect here is the narrative introduction. Unlike the other examples we'll discuss, the intro of Firewatch gives you a say in its outcome, kind of. The main beats are there regardless of your answers, but the little bits of choice you're provided allow you to more directly place yourself in the situation of Henry's, the protagonist's, life. By allowing the player choice in the introductory narrative, they're able to more easily empathize with Henry's plight, since it feels like the player's plight as well. We understand the choices that brought him to his isolation because they're the choices we made, even if we didn't like the options. By the time you arrive at the Fire Lookout Tower, you're already fully committed to Henry's journey, and if you were anything like me, you were compelled to continue it. The intro to Firewatch serves not only to draw you further into its narrative and commit you to its characters through your own choices, but also to familiarize the player with the kind of game Firewatch is going to be. A game of choices. Sure, there's a lot of walking through the woods, but the primary mechanic of the game and the primary method of story delivery are your conversations with Delilah, the sole occupant of the other fire lookout tower across the valley. She'll give you a prompt, and you're given a choice in how to respond. Now, on the opposite end of the narrative spectrum is the intro to Hyperlight Drifter, which is completely wordless, and only relies on its imagery to convey its story. The mechanical tutorial section is straightforward enough that I won't dwell on it much more than I already have within this sentence. The more important part of Hyperlight's opening is the introduction to the narrative. The opening cutscene is captivating not only because of its wordlessness, but also because of its haunting visuals. Unlike the opening scenes of Firewatch and Doom, Hyperlight's opening moments are not an entirely literal telling of the events of that world. 
a hauntingly beautiful score by Disasterpiece underscores images of sprawling, pixelated vistas, nightmarish behemoths, and our plagued hero, the Drifter. We learn of the destruction of the old world by some undetermined but undeniably apocalyptic event. Echoes of this can be seen in Hyperlight's playable environments, implying that of everything in Hyperlight's opening scene, this is real. But it's the rest that's open to interpretation. In the wake of Hyperlight's apocalypse, we're introduced to the Drifter, who appears within a sanguine sea of bodies and coughs their own blood into the already ankle-high crimson pool. And much in the same way the Drifter first appeared, these bodies flicker out of existence, and the Drifter's expelled blood darkens and coalesces into a billowing black behemoth, which, though seemingly slain by the Drifter in a preemptive strike, reforms into an even more massive and monolithic foe. This enemy appears at various points throughout the rest of the game, but always in the context of the Drifter's sickness, and never in the same physical plane as the rest of the world's playable areas. We get the idea from the opening cutscene that the Drifter is familiar with the creature, as they're seemingly aware enough of its intentions to try to kill it before it fully forms, but it also raises the question of the literal existence of the monster. Hyperlight Drifter creator Alex Preston has stated in numerous interviews that the story and world of Hyperlight are loosely autobiographical, as Alex himself has struggled with a congenital heart disease, amongst other ailments. Alex and the Drifter both suffer from chronic ailments, and though they've spent a lifetime searching for cures, are haunted by the illness they can't escape. And this is the key takeaway the opening scene of Hyperlight so skillfully and wordlessly conveys, the inescapability of the Drifter's illness, as shown by the monstrous creature that has pursued the Drifter all this time. Now, somewhere in the middle of Hyperlight's subtle and Firewatch's explicit storytelling is Doom 2016, which features a near-flawless tutorial section. The first thing you hear after Doom's opening loading screen fades to black are these words. They are rage. Brutal. Without mercy. But you, you will be worse. Rip and tear. Until it is done. Now, what do we learn from this dialogue? Well, amidst the poetic nature of the description, we can infer that our character, who we'll learn is called the Doom Slayer, is feared by someone or something, and they're capable of great violence. Rip and tear are not delicate verbs. They're verbs for someone worse than rage and brutality. These words are but a prelude to the actual intro of the Doom Slayer, who awakens on a stone slab surrounded by dead bodies and nightmarish demons. Through sheer strength, the Doomslayer bursts from their shackles and crushes a nearby demon's bloody skull against the stone prison. Collecting a pistol from the floor, the Doomslayer continues on through the facility, every part of which is equally coated in human viscera and demonic imagery. The game introduces you to the pistol and the shotgun and the behaviors of the introductory demons. It dumps you into an arena to familiarize you with the style of Doom's most prolific combat spaces. But what this introductory area also does, despite John Carmack's famous adage that the story in a Doom game is like the story in a pornographic film, is to introduce you to Doom's narrative and characters. We learn that Doom Guy has no patience for bureaucracy, and we learn that all this is the UAC's fault. For example, when you finally begin your ascent out of the opening area, Dr. Samuel Hayden, who you so rudely hung up on moments earlier, patches his voice into the elevator. Let's take a look at that exchange. I'm willing to take full responsibility for the horrible events of the last 24 hours, but you must understand. Our interest in their world was purely for the betterment of mankind. You see what happened there? This is classic show-don't-tell storytelling. When Hayden speaks that the UAC's interest in Hell was for the, quote, betterment of humanity, the camera tilts down to the body of a dead UAC employee. In that moment, we learn everything we need to know about the UAC's real motivations for exploring Hell, and how we should feel about it. So these are three intros I think best exemplify how to onboard a player to a modern video game. The key philosophies at play here are to, if a game has a narrative, to determine what they need to know at the start and reveal it in as elegant a way as possible, and to introduce game mechanics organically as the player traverses the introductory level. And what modern games do you think have great player intros? Let us know in the comments. And then it'll cut to a call to action. Hey everybody, this is Jake Terrio with Subpixel. If you've made it this far, hopefully it means you enjoyed that video that you just watched. So if you could leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not subscribed already, that lets us and our robot overlords at YouTube know that this video is worth watching. So thank you for that, and we'll see you next time.